Good morning, and welcome to worship on this 17th day of December 2023. This is the third Sunday of the season of Advent. Thank you for joining us here at St. Stephen. I'm glad we can connect. We begin this morning with the lighting of the Advent candle for this third week. We praise you, O God, for this victory wreath that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, strengthen our hearts as we await the Lord's coming in glory. Enlighten us with your grace so that we may serve our neighbors in need, and grant all this through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the great movement of the Holy Spirit, Jesus whose coming is certain, and the Holy Spirit whose day draws near. Blessed be God forever. Continue this morning with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who opens the heavens and who draws near to us with the gift of salvation. Amen. God is patient and merciful. God desires all to come to repentance. Gathered together this morning, we are trusting this great promise of grace, and we confess our sin. Everlasting God, you love justice and you hate wrongdoing. You confess the fear, greed, and self-centeredness that make us reluctant to work against oppression. We are complicit in systems of exploitation. We often choose comfort over courage. We are careless with creation's bounty. So we ask that you would look upon us with mercy, that you would turn our hearts again to you. We ask that you would make us glad to do your will and to walk in your ways for the sake of our waiting world. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. God clothes you with the garments of salvation and covers you with robes of righteousness. In the tender compassion of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And God's covenant with you is from now until all of eternity. God's blessing rests upon you and upon us all. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing me, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. And this took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel. Okay, so can you think of a time uh, that you made a promise and it was important that you kept it? 
Can you ever think of a promise that you made, that you kept, and maybe even was life-changing that you kept this promise? Can you think of a time that you made a promise and it was important that you broke it? Ever take a vow or an oath and uh, you needed to break it? Uh, the two sides of that are keeping it and breaking it, right? What oaths, what commitments are you locked into right now? What promises have you made that are directing your days? Uh, what commitments do you have or promises or oaths are you trying to keep? Have you ever broken a promise that you now regret or feel guilty about? Is there a promise someone else has made to you that has been broken and that this uh, memory or this broken promise has become difficult for you? This morning, I am thinking about a person who is maybe known to you, maybe not, but maybe known to you. I'm thinking about a person who's kind of famous, I mean they have a Wikipedia page, uh, and I'm thinking of a person without whom you and I might not be here. We might not be gathered for worship this morning. I'm thinking of a person whose fame and whose import is based essentially on not keeping a promise. The person I'm thinking of uh, became influential for you and I uh, and has affected our lives, uh, but mostly the thing that triggered that was not keeping a promise. Who am I? Can you think of who I'm thinking of? This is a woman. She is commemorated by the church. That means she has a day that is remembered by the church, and that day is annually on December 20th. I know that today is December 17th, uh, but I'm maybe getting ahead of myself a little bit, but she'll be commemorated this week on December 20th. This is the woman that I'm thinking about. So this is coming up. Her day is coming up. And she's this sort of famous one. Uh, she's the one who we owe ourselves being together like this this morning. And uh, this all stems from promise breaking. Who is this? Who am I? Who am I thinking of? The person I am thinking about uh, may have gone to great lengths to get out of their promise. They made a promise and they went to probably great lengths to get out of it. Uh, this is a deviation, uh, oath breaking, uh, a moving away from a commitment that makes her famous to us, that makes her known to us. As a matter of fact, she made a promise, and there's a legend that says that she snuck out of the place of that promise in a herring barrel on a cart. And the church commemorates this woman on December 20th every year. She is recognized by the church. We are beholding to her. Who is it that I'm thinking of? I wanted you to enter into this by thinking about promises, and promises kept and promises broken, but in particular I'm thinking about someone who the church will honor on December 20th and who we are beholding to. Who is this? Who am I thinking of? The woman I'm thinking of ended up, after breaking her promise, being married to someone I know that we know, because I talk about this guy all the time. This person broke their promise and ended up married to a person I talk about all the time. It's in our name. Who is it that I'm thinking of? She was 16 years younger than the person that she married. Uh, and he was initially in charge of getting her married off to someone else. But in the end, uh, they ended up married, and their relationship is absolutely the reason that we have a church today. All of this is built on the idea that she broke a promise or did not keep an oath. Uh, who is this? Who is it that the church commemorates on December 20th? Who am I thinking? This person, this woman, absolutely held this guy that we all know and love together. She absolutely made it possible for him to have the impact that he does. She bore children. She bore his children. Uh, she organized and kept his entire movement together, and she ended up dying six years after his death. 
she was actually fleeing Wittenberg uh, from the plague and was on another cart, uh, another story of a cart. The last time she was in a hickle barrel, uh, she was on, in a, a, a herring barrel. Um, this time she was fleeing after, after her husband's death, uh, a breakout of the plague, and she was thrown off the cart and uh, died in a ditch. And uh, her last words were, I will stick to Christ as a burr sticks to cloth. Who am I? Who am I thinking of? Who is this person? Who is this woman that the church honors and whose life is built mostly on the idea that she broke a promise? She's commemorated by the church on December 20th. She was a nun before marrying Martin, and she seldom gets the credit that he gets, even though she deserves it. She probably did more than he did. Who is she? She isn't the great reformer, Martin Luther, but she was his wife. She definitely gets less airplay, uh, but she probably did more to ensure the Reformation took hold than anybody else. We absolutely would not be gathered together this morning, not in the way that we are, without her. Her name is Katrina von Bora, or as we know her, Katie Luther. How much do you know about the witness, the life, the presence, the being that is Katie Luther. How much do you know about this person that the church honors on December 20th? Katarina von Bora, and with a name like von Bora, she's absolutely German, right? She was born in Germany in 1499. But in about 1505, and I know these dates seem like so long ago, but this is a person whose life and whose work has an impact on us today. The church honors her to this day, and she's an important figure, a mother of our church. About six years after she was born, her mother died, and that had a big impact on the rest of her life. Her dad uh, would neither be able to raise her well, or it turned out would be able to afford a dowry for her marriage. She had several siblings, she had several sisters, and uh, because uh, she was among the youngest of them, he was concerned about his ability to care for her. And in that world, uh, to have her be married, that was an important sort of thing that, that needed to happen. And um, he was concerned about this. So ultimately, he made the decision for her by sending her to live at a Benedictine school. She had two aunts that were there, and he sent her to live with those aunts. And so she grew up around a Benedictine school, Katie von Bora, Katie ultimately Luther. And she became consecrated at a nun, as a nun of her own volition. She made this promise to be a nun at age 16 in 1515. And so this is the oath or the promise that she broke. And part of who we are is based on the idea that she broke this promise. We wouldn't be talking, I wouldn't be talking about her if it wasn't for this broken promise. The promise, the, the oath, the vow she made to the nunnery and to being a nun. And she made that promise at 16 and I know, hey, that seems awfully young to make such a life uh, commitment and maybe that's why she broke it. But in her world, 16 was not as young as it is in our world. The idea of teenagers uh, and, and the living as a teen didn't exist then like it does now. And while her situation was pretty sad, people lived shorter back then. And so it was common for people to make life decisions a little earlier. And so that's not why she broke it. It wasn't her youth. Uh, she was, I think, and according to all testimonies, fully dedicated to God and to her belief that she was called to live as a nun. And so she made this uh, oath uh, of her own free will, and it ended up being a promise that she broke. Sometimes promises kept have an impact, sometimes promises broken have an impact. So the nunnery that she committed to, that Katie von Bora committed to, was really strict. A Benedictine monastery is about as strict of a monastery as there was. Some of the monasteries were looser, but hers was strict. And according to uh, the way the Reformation broke out, she was a nun as the Reformation was beginning. Remember that the date that we, that we say that the Reformation began is in October of 1517, and she was, and Katie was a nun at that point. In 1519, Luther preached a sermon in and around the town 
potentially even with the nuns in attendance, where Katie was. We don't know if she was in attendance or not, but that was the first time the idea of the Reformation really began to get home to the area where Katie's nunnery was. And people, including all the nuns of Katie's uh, um, nunnery, began to read Luther's Reformation writings. And so along with uh, most of the nuns in Katie's nunnery, Katie seems to have been moved and was in line with the thinking of the Reformation. Part of this had to do with the idea of cloisters, of monasteries or nunneries and their existence. Luther did not think that you had to be cloistered, that you had to be a monk or a nun in order to worship or be doing God's will. And he wrote about this extensively, and that was part of the idea that really took hold with these nuns, and it led to the breaking of their vows, right? In 1523, on the night before Easter, Katie von Bora and 11 other nuns were snuck out of their nunnery. That's that herring barrel. Uh, it was arrangements were made for the cart, the cart, the guy with the cart to come by with the herring barrel for them to, this is maybe legend, but hide in the herring barrels and be taken out of the nunnery and break their vows. And uh, this is a broken promise. If you started out by thinking a promise is kept and broken, then you'll be able to enter into this part. Uh, broken promises are controversial, right? Those don't happen without some pain and angst. They don't happen without controversy. Nuns leaving a nunnery were assumed in Germany in the, in, in the 1500s to have really bad morality problems. That's as far as I'll go with it. Um, you can imagine what the morality must be. You know, it's got to be sexual stuff here, right? And there's a lot of controversy around that. And nuns leaving a nunnery, breaking this promise, uh, were heavily, heavily disparaged. And Katie was throughout the rest of her life. Marrying a nun or a former nun was a crime in Germany, okay? But as these nuns began to leave the nunnery, Katie, these eleven, and other nuns and monks began to leave the cloistered life, believing in the Reformation that life was best lived in contact with God's creation and not withdrawn from it, being unmarried also caused a problem. As controversial as it would be to become married, it was even sort of weirder to leave and not be married. It was assumed that your morality was incredibly lax, that you were pretty promiscuous or something. And so this became a problem. Luther himself ended up arranging marriages for the 12 nuns that left the nunnery. And then you hear this, arranged marriages. Oh, we don't like that. We like to fall in love and have choices. Germany worked a little different at this time. I'm not saying it's better, I'm just saying that's the way it worked. And so arranged marriages at that point weren't maybe as bad as its triggers in us. Uh, but Katie Katharina von Bora was engaged to a student at Wittenberg, not Martin Luther, a student at Wittenberg. His parents did not want him to break that wall about marrying nuns. And so he was led to break it off. Uh, they thought it would be an illegal marriage and they talked him out. Next, Martin found a doctor that was willing to marry Katie. But Katie, a little bit outside of the norm of arranged marriages, did not have any interest in this doctor and said no. So Luther successfully married 11 of the nuns from this nunnery, but Katie was unmarried and he faced this issue. Yes, it's illegal to, to have a nun get married in, in that world, uh, but it's even more questionable for them to have left the monastery and just be out there uncared for, unattached, and presumably, or uh, sort of people pointing fingers or witnessing about their character like they're morally lax. And so Martin solved this problem by proposing himself. And Katie accepted. And uh, that was pretty controversial too, because now we have a former monk marrying a former nun. It looks as though they broke their promises to God, their oaths to God, really because of being lustful. And so there's a lot of uh, woodcuts from the time that show the married Martin Luther and Katie Luther and depict them as pigs and other things. And so they were disparaged uh, for their beliefs that led them to breaking this promise. 
the world has difficulty with promise breaking and with new things and we are a people that fall into disparaging so easy and Katie herself was often depicted in woodcuts or drawings like a pig she was disparaged and uh, this is something that just frankly blew people's minds so uh, Luther eventually is quoted as saying who would read in the stars that I would cause my father so much trouble and get into an argument with the Pope and then take a runaway nun as my wife. Somehow, while I was doing other things, God gave Katie to me. And the two were married on June 13, 1525. And this is church practice back then. People did not get married in the church in the 1500s in Germany. So they were married on the church steps and they uh, moved into the Black Cloister. The, uh, the former monastery that Luther lived in it was a sort of dormitory for monks, and this is where uh, Luther, Martin, and Katie lived out the rest of their lives. And the thing is, especially when we think about Katie and who she is and how she witnesses to, to God and to God's work in the world, uh, it's more than broken promises and disparaging drawings. She lived a pretty rough and not easy life. Records show us that Katie woke up at 4.30 every morning to cook and clean the dormitory. The black cloister housed an ongoing rotation of up to 40 students, followers, believers in the Reformation, former nun monks and nuns, who up to 40 of these at a time would be moving in and out of the black cloister to come and talk and study and learn about the Reformation from Mark. And Katie was in charge of all of their care, and transportation, paying for it, and uh, allotting funds, uh, she was the manager of the Reformation, the literal manager. On top of this, uh, Katie was continually disparaged for being married to a, being a former nun who broke this promise, but married to a former monk uh, throughout all this time. Uh, um, and Luther did not handle the stress of uh, being the great reformer very well his body began to break down. He had already had bowel issues and some heavy uh, inclinations toward depression, uh, but his body began to break down over time. And all these people coming and going from his life uh, demanded so much of him uh, that ultimately it really became Katie who would visit with people who came. He's continued to write uh, and do some other things, but he really uh, deferred to Katie more and more as time went on. Katie was a good nun. She had learned how to brew beer, and she brewed the beer for the Black Cloister that it became known for. She cooked, she cleaned, she handled and actually grew all of the financial holdings of the Black Cloister and the Reformation Church. She planted and tended multiple gardens. She consulted with all or most of the visitors. She nursed Luther, she became a mother, and she uh, precipitated almost all of Luther's writings on the Reformation, on family, on children, on children's education, and she was a part of all of that. After Martin Luther's death, she was forced to leave the Black Cloister because of the Schmalkedic War and the Black Plague. And it was while leaving the Black Cloister on a cart that she was thrown into a ditch and died from her injuries at 53. And I told you that people didn't live very long back then. Uh, her last words were noted and are remembered. I will stick to Christ as a burr sticks to cloth. I will stick to Christ as a burr sticks to cloth. And so while she is a story of promises made and some not kept, she broke her promises to the nunnery, she certainly is uh, also a witness to who God is and how God is at work. In this morning's gospel, we hear the story of John the witness, John the one who comes before Jesus and points to who Jesus is. And so I've shared with you the story of Katie Luther, the person who the church commemorates on December 20th, because to me it's a story about witnessing. Because Katie Luther does not point to Martin Luther. She doesn't point to uh, the brokenness of humanity, like the mothers that die or pig drawings that are made. She doesn't point to uh, disparaging people. She doesn't even point to busy work and how hectic her life was, as much as she points with her words to the God behind it all. And so in that way, she is a fulfillment, a living out of this story of John the Baptist that we get in this morning's gospel, a witness. 
And so I wanted you to think about it. Why is this significant today? Why do we tell the stories of John the Baptist, of Katie Luther, of witnesses to God's goodness and God's work at all? There, uh, there are uh, this sort of uh, inspiration here, I hope, and I hope that's why we tell these stories. I think, too, we tell them because uh, the world that we live in is, uh, while it's similar to what it looked like year after year after year, in the midst of all sorts of significant change. And you and I live in this world and we have all these expectations of where the world should go or where God might call it, uh, but we're sitting here in the midst of the, the work and the costs of, of, of this changing world. And we maybe know somewhere inside how broken and how perplexing this world is. And so the power of stories and of witness becomes important as a reminder of forbearance and of God's work in us that keeps us in a season like Advent waiting, and not just waiting for ourselves, but waiting because we insist upon and are called into the idea that God is still at work and that we are part of that work even if it's just living as who God makes us and pointing. The story of who Katie Luther is deserves to be told because her life is one in everyday work and existence of pointing to how God is at work and how that can be ups and downs, promises kept and promises broken and all sorts of other crazy details. Our lives are like that too. And the question is, in the midst of craziness, uh, like John the Baptist, like Katie Von Bora, in the midst of uh, crazy clothes, or people coming out to see you, or uh, all the stuff that's going on, uh, do we acknowledge the promise God has made to us, and do we point back to this God who loves us? And maybe in doing so, we have these deepened and more meaningful lives. Maybe it's not what we buy for Christmas, uh, but it's uh, how we make the money that buys the things and how we use who we are and who God has made us as a witness to God uh, in God's work in the world. To begin, I asked you to think about promises kept and promises broken. To me, as Lutherans, our well-being, God's work, God's future, our being preserved for God and by God, is not, this is not built upon our promises. It's built upon God's promise to us, that God loves us and that God values us enough that Jesus would come into our world for us and that Jesus would identify with us and make us who we are is the promise that matters. We're called into uh, pointing to these promises. In the midst of all that pointing, some of the promises we make or keep or some of the promises that are made to us uh, or don't keep uh, affect our days. But the question always is, is our life defined by all those promises or is it defined by God's promise to us? Are our lives about the promises we make or are our lives about the promise God makes to us? I would say it's the latter and this is how we witness. By knowing that we have been claimed by God knowing that ours is not a cloistered life, that ours is not a life uh, that's supposed to be better or elevated or removed from everybody else, but we are just like everybody. We are Katie Von Bora at home, mothering and fathering and being a spouse and doing our tasks, and that this is where God sets us and the promises that these places are holy. And the way that we live into uh, the promise of John the Baptist and of Katie Von Bora and ultimately into the calling of God is to witness to how God's promise has embraced us and been unfailing for us. Katie Von Bora lived a life of certainty. It was public, uh, but she lived a life of humility. She was certain of God's promise for her, even past her own promises. Her public life uh, was means that her life wasn't always hers, and sometimes she was disparaged in, in really disgusting ways. But that never stopped her from being who God made her. And she was humble, always past, 
pointing not to herself and not to her husband like he was some great thing, but past that to God, to Christ, saying that uh, I'm a burr on this cloth of Christ and that's the most I can ever say and lift up. Our culture wants to tell us that our lives are very uncertain that our religion and our faith are private and that they shouldn't be shared. And our culture wants to tell us that it's all about us and how great our lives can be. But uh, this life of witnessing reminds us that it doesn't have to be that. That we should live in certainty of the promise God makes for us. That no matter how public or, or how the public views our lives, our witness is to just stand in those places disparaged or not and point to a God who has cared for us and to a God who has died for us and to a God who will rise again and brings us to new life and it's to point to that God for us and for others. And this is a humble pointing, it's a humble act. Our tendency is to, uh, to tell our own stories and so I've spent this time telling the story of someone else because our testimony about who God is is less significant than Christ's testimony about who God is. This is what defines us. This is what makes it Christmas. This is what makes us holy. Not so much just our testimony, although we stand and we point and that uh, can be a powerful thing. What we're pointing to is that God's promise is for us and it is for you. And God promises to build up and keep people in the midst of a world of kept and broken promises. And Jesus' testimony about us is, is that our lives are difficult and sin-ridden and that we need saved. And Jesus' testimony to us is, is that difficulty and sinfulness and needing saved isn't the totality of who we are. But you and I, Katie, John the Baptist, and all those that have come before us and all those that will come after, our own uh, family, are all part of the risen new life community of saints and this is what it means to be faithful to be who god made us to live in the midst of promises the best we can but to always point that it isn't about our promises made and kept it's about god's promise made and always kept and always bringing new life to us and to the world around us Let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the words of your prophets, so that, anointed by your Holy Spirit, we may testify to your light, like John, like Katie, like so many that have gone before us. Help us to be certain, public, Help us to be humble. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who lives and who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Stay safe. Remember that you are a witness to God, to God's work in our midst, and to all that we hope for and all that we want to be good in this wonderful creation. No matter what the story of the world around us is, and no matter what it says to the contrary, witness to and be a part of God's goodness. Stay safe. I'll see you soon.